he has a chance of becoming president. Uh, and if an attack like this were to happen, I think his chances increase uh, exponentially. I want to turn right now to what took place yesterday in Washington. All three remaining Republican candidates and Democrat Hillary Clinton addressed the pro-Israel APAC conference on Monday. Clinton sought to cast herself as a stronger ally to Israel than Republican frontrunner Donald Trump, repeatedly alluding to Trump's recent declaration he would be, quote, neutral when negotiating a peace deal between Israelis and Palestinians. Many saw Clinton's address as an attempt to cast herself to Trump's right on Israel. Israel. It's also why, as president, I will make a firm commitment to ensure Israel maintains its qualitative military edge. The United States should provide Israel with the most sophisticated defense technology so it can deter and stop any threats. That includes bolstering Israeli missile defenses with new systems like the Arrow 3 and David Sling. And we should work together to develop better tunnel detection technology to prevent arms smuggling, kidnapping, and terrorist attacks. That's Hillary Clinton yesterday addressing AIPAC, the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee. Donald Trump faced a boycott by rabbis who said they were offended by Trump's remarks against Mexicans, Muslims and Jews and wanted to, quote, shine a moral light on the darkness that's enveloped Mr. Trump's campaign, unquote. During his address, Trump sought to cast himself as a strong ally of Israel. The Palestinians must come to the table knowing that the bond between the United States and Israel is absolutely, totally unbreakable. They must come to the table willing and able to stop the terror being committed on a daily basis against Israel. We will move the American embassy to the eternal capital of the Jewish people, Jerusalem. Democratic candidate Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders was the only top candidate to skip the APEC conference, saying he needed to continue campaigning ahead of today's primaries in Arizona and Utah in the Democratic caucus in Idaho. But he did address the issue on the campaign trail. I am here to tell the American people that if elected president, I will work tirelessly to advance the cause of peace as a partner and as a friend to Israel. But to be successful, we have, we have also got to be a friend not only to Israel, but to the Palestinian people. <laughs> Where in Gaza, unemployment today is 44 percent, and uh, we have there a poverty rate which is almost as high. That's Bernie Sanders speaking in Salt Lake City. For a debate on the candidates' speeches, we continue with Yusuf Munayir, the executive director of the U.S. campaign to end the Israeli occupation, and Robert Friedman, a visiting professor of political science at Johns Hopkins University, the former president of Baltimore Hebrew University. Let's begin with you, um, uh, Robert Friedman. Professor Friedman, talk about the candidates yesterday before APAC, the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee. Sure, there were six issues which cut across all the candidates. The deal with Iran, the question of moving the American embassy to Jerusalem, the issue of Palestinian terrorism, the issue of supporting Israeli security, relations with Israel and especially Netanyahu, and the UN Security Council resolution if it takes place on an Arab-Israeli peace agreement. Now, if you look at the main candidates, and here I'm looking not only at the speeches, but also of the two-hour discussion on CNN following the speeches. Uh, I think you find the following. On the Iran deal, Clinton, keep the deal, but mistrust and verify it. Trump, abolish it, negotiate a new deal. Kasich, suspend it because of the missile tests. Cruz, flat out abolish it, and Sanders, keep it. On moving the embassy to Jerusalem, Clinton said no because of the negative effect on the Middle East. Trump, Kasich, and Cruz, well, Trump said yes, Kasich said he would study it, Cruz said yes, and Sanders said no. On Palestinian terrorism and incitement, that is so-called the culture of martyrdom and death, 
taught in Palestinian schools, everybody was critical. Clinton, Trump, Kasich, and Cruz denounced it. Sanders said, but you have to look at, as we heard on the clip, the very negative situation in Gaza economically. And the question of supporting Israeli security, again, Clinton, Trump, Kasich, and Cruz all supported it strongly. Uh, Sanders was a bit weaker on this. On relations with Netanyahu and Israel, Clinton, again, Trump, Kasich, and Cruz all moved to say they want to improve it. Um, but Sanders, in his CNN talk, said, well, you have to look at Netanyahu, who's a lot of the cause of the problems. On settlements, uh, Clinton criticized it. Sanders strongly criticized it. Trump, Kasich, and Cruz didn't discuss it at all. And finally, on the UN Security Council resolution on the Arab-Israeli conflict, assuming the French initiative comes through, uh, Clinton said she, he, she would veto, Trump said he would veto, Kasich said he would veto, Cruz said he would veto, and Sanders didn't discuss it, but said he would work very hard for a Palestinian-Israeli peace agreement. So, I mean, those are six or seven issues where they really differed. That What I took away from this, interestingly enough, was that Kasich and Clinton were actually fairly close on a lot of the issues. And uh, I wouldn't say so much that Clinton uh, was the right to the right of Trump. I would say rather that Trump was to the left of Cruz and Kasich was to the left of both of the others. Now, how this works out in reality following the election, of course, it's one thing to make promises before the election. It's another thing to make promises and, and carry them out afterwards. And very quickly, in response to Yusuf, uh, killing civilians deliberately for political reasons is terrorism, whether it takes place in Jerusalem uh, or whether it takes place in Brussels. Claiming that this is a reaction, it's okay for a young lady or a young man to go and kill Israeli civilians because this is, you know, protesting the occupation is simply wrong. And, and this is why the main candidates all denounced it and denounced it loudly. Yusuf Monayir, your response? I don't, I don't think anyone is uh, justifying the, the murder of anyone else. Uh, the, uh, what I was responding to, though, was the mischaracterization uh, of the uh, type of political violence that we see uh, in Israel and Palestine uh, as uh, something similar to the uh, type of violence that we saw uh, today in, in Brussels. Uh, there is clearly a context of occupation, uh, the denial of people's rights that are going on uh, in, uh, in Palestine, uh, which is uh, fomenting and, and allowing uh, this system of inequality to continue, is allowing the incentives for violence to remain in place. Uh, and I don't think that is uh, in any way uh, the same as the type of uh, terrorism and the type of worldview uh, and the type of extremism that is involved in, uh, in, in ISIS. Uh, and, and I would like to say as well, while I appreciate the, the nuanced uh, enumeration uh, of the different positions of the candidate that, that our interlocutor has, has presented, uh, I really don't see that great of a difference uh, between all of these uh, candidates. And I think, frankly, uh, one of the biggest problems that was on display was the uh, ritual obeisance of uh, the uh, candidates for president before a pro-Israel uh, interest group, essentially lining up one after the other uh, to outbid each other in their support for Israel, a state which is uh, conducting a military occupation over the lives of millions of people, denying millions more basic rights to return uh, to their homes and villages as uh, refugees, uh, all while collecting billions of dollars of uh, American military aid and then using those very weapons to commit heinous uh, human rights violations and violations of international law uh, through the expansion of these settlements that were uh, you know, almost not mentioned uh, there. You know, we, we heard, uh, you know, maybe a brief, brief comment 
from uh, from Hillary Clinton about it, which was quickly wrapped up in uh, another line about how she would uh, make sure that the United Nations would never be allowed to act on uh, Israeli settlements if she was uh, if she was to be president. Let me go to a uh, clip, so, Yusuf, and get your response sure. to Hillary Clinton addressing AIPAC yesterday, speaking out against settlements, but said she would not support any solutions enforced by the United Nations, the one you're referring to. Everyone has to do their part by avoiding damaging actions, including with respect to settlements. Now, America has an important role to play in supporting peace efforts. And as president, I would continue the pursuit of direct negotiations. And let me be clear, I would vigorously oppose any attempt by outside parties to impose a solution, including by the U.N. Security Council. Yusuf Munayir. These are extremely empty words, and I think it, it, it really highlights the corruption of U.S. policy uh, on this very issue, specifically the issue of settlements. You know, in the late 1960s and 1968, uh, there was a, a national intelligence estimate that was put together regarding Israel after they had began their occupation of Palestinian territory in the West Bank and Gaza. And it said that if the Israelis continue to occupy this territory for two to three years and build settlements there, it'll be impossible for them to turn back the land. That was in 1968. As recently as last week, the Israelis continued again to expropriate land deep inside the West Bank, this time outside of Jericho, in an area that's nowhere near the Green Line. And the response from the State Department was simply, well, you know, we find this troubling and it, it, it leads us to question the intentions of the Israelis and whether or not they're committed. If all you can do over the course of five decades is response is respond to Israeli settlement expansion and colonialism with empty words while continuing to fork over billions of dollars to ensure that the status quo continues, then you're really only giving the green light to the Israelis that this is A-OK. -okay. And so, uh, you know, for Clinton to make a comment like that, I think is really just a reminder of the corruption of American policy uh, on this issue, which, frankly, transcends the American political divide in the United States as well. Professor Friedman, your response. Well, I, I agree, actually, with Yusuf on one issue, and that is the problem caused by the settlements. Uh, I happen to be, this is program is called Democracy Now. I happen to be a member of an organization called Peace Now, which has been deploring the settlements from the beginning, and I deplore them as well, uh, whether it's Ariel, which is sort of like a bone in the mouth of, of any future uh, Palestinian state, which hopefully, since I'm a supporter of the two-state solution strongly, as, by the way, is Mrs. Clinton, uh, which she also said in her presentation. Uh, I, I share the problem of the settlement expansion, yet Yosef tends to overlook a few issues of history. Palestinians were offered a state by the UN in 1947, rejected it. Uh, Omert in 1968 came up with a plan, really a very good two-state solution, including sharing Jerusalem. Uh, Palestinians rejected it. Uh, in 2008, and then this most recent effort by the United States during the Kerry, uh, a nine-month effort, uh, the Palestinians and, and Mr. Abbas didn't even respond to the American plan. So one can talk about occupation and occupation, but unless and until the Palestinians are willing to come out with an agreement on a two-state solution, Number one. Wait, let, let's take uh, each of your points at a time. Uh, Yusuf Munir on this point. Yeah, I, and, and look, there's, there's a lot of things to respond to here, which I think are, are, are patently incorrect, um, starting in 1947 with the claim that the UN offered the, the Palestinians a, a state. The reality is that they imposed, wanted to impose an outcome that would uh, actually deny the Palestinians sovereignty over land in which they lived. Uh, and offer them a, a fraction of the territory in which they constituted a majority of the population. 
So, um, you know, we can, we can go through all the history. I think the history is very clear. If you look at the trend over time, the trend is simply this. Palestinians have been continually removed from their land from 1948 until today. That trend uh, continues largely uninterrupted. But let's focus on the issue in which we uh, ostensibly agree here, which is on, on this question of, of settlements. And, and uh, Mr. Friedman has said he's a supporter of peace now. You know, the problem I have with, uh, with this line of, of, of advocacy is that it is never followed up with any sort of policy prescriptions, which would actually change Israeli behavior as it relates to settlements. We hear lots of empty words when it comes to the settlements are not good, the settlements are a problem, the settlements pose a challenge to a two-state solution. And yet, the actions that follow that, both from the United States government and in terms of the advocacy of people, uh, even in groups that uh, oppose these settlements, is, is almost never to call for different policies in relation to the support for Israel that enables this kind of settlement expansion to happen. If you are saying that settlements are wrong, but at the same time support unending military aid to Israel, you are saying one thing with your mouth and something very different with your actions. And over the course of 50 years, 50 years, the, the, the occupation this June is entering its 50th year. We've seen a huge growth in the number of settlers. We've seen a huge growth in the number of settlements. The uh, West Bank looks like Swiss cheese. And yet we have people who are still talking about creating an independent Palestinian state here and not doing anything to actually change Israeli behavior, which is destroying that. So if Mr. Friedman or anyone else, for that matter, wants to be taken seriously and at their word when they say that they agree that settlements are a problem when it comes to the two-state solution, we want to hear, at the same time, policy prescriptions, U.S. policy prescriptions, that would change Israeli behavior as it relates to these settlements. Otherwise, just talking about it like this is providing cover for these settlements, providing cover for the occupation, and providing cover for the status quo. I wanted to turn to uh, Hillary Clinton again in her speech before APAC, um, slamming BDS, the Boycott Divestment Sanctions Movement. Many of the young people here today are on the front lines of the battle to oppose the alarming boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement known as BDS. <laughs> Particularly at a time when anti-Semitism is on the rise across the world, especially in Europe, we must repudiate all efforts to malign, isolate, and undermine Israel and the Jewish people. I've been sounding the alarm for a while now. As I wrote last year in a letter to the heads of major American Jewish organizations, we have to be united in fighting back against BDS. Many of its proponents have demonized Israeli scientists and intellectuals, even students. To all the college students who may have encountered this on campus, I hope you stay strong. Keep speaking out. Don't let anyone silence you, bully you, or try to shut down debate, especially in places of learning like colleges and universities. Anti-Semitism has no place in any civilized society, not in America, not in Europe, not anywhere. That was Hillary Clinton yesterday addressing APEC. Professor Robert Friedman, your response to the issue of BDS, the Boycott Divestment Sanctions okay. Movement. There are two related issues here. First of all, I've got to respond to Yusuf because his view of history obviously does not coincide with mine. but in one area where he seems to be unaware of what's going on, there are regular protests in Israel against the settlements, led by Shalom Akshav or Peace Now. There is attempts lobbying of the Knesset. Unfortunately, for the future of a two-state solution, 
the peace now people are not in the majority in the Israeli parliament, but that's a democracy. They continue to advocate. They continue to oppose the settlements. That's number one. Number two, this $3 billion plus a year in military aid. Perhaps Yosef hasn't been in Israel or in Gaza. When rockets continue to fly from Gaza into Israel, killing Israeli civilians. Now, Israel pulled out of Gaza in 2005, 2006 under Ariel Sharon. And what has moved the Israeli body politic to the right is the fact that instead of peace, Israel got rocketed in return for pulling out of Gaza. Now, that should be noted. And hence, the United States in supplying aid for Iron Dome, now David Sling, Arrow 3, which would be used against the threat from Iran, which has called for the destruction of Israel, most recently inscribed in Farsi on the rockets. And this was pointed out by a number of the speakers at APAC yesterday. But this is the first thing. Second thing, uh, let, BDS. Let, let's, uh, let, let me you... answer, let me answer the BDS. Okay, very quickly. BDS is, it's very, very important. The people who support BDS seem to be ignorant of other problems in the Middle East. More than a quarter million people have died in Syria. 40,000 plus are dying at the, at, in Kurds in Turkey. But not only that, countries like China support Syria, as well as attacking their own Muslim populations. Russia has slaughtered people in, in Chechnya. But nobody is talking about stopping educational ties with China, Chinese universities, or with Russian universities, or with Turkish universities. The concentration seems to be, well, Israel's bad, we've got to stop educational ties with Israel. Now, folks, there's a lot of crying about Islamophobia that one hears every day. But singling out Israel, when there's so many worse things happening in the world, I think is, in fact, anti-Semitism. Yusuf no Monayir, you have it. the last word here. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of, to respond to there. Let me just say a couple things. First of all, not only have I been to Israel, I, I was born in Israel, I have family throughout Israel, the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and refugee camps around the area. Nobody has a deep, uh, of, uh, as a deep appreciation of what American weaponry does in the Middle East as I do. Uh, precisely because uh, I've, I've seen it in, in, in both directions. And I understand what it means when one-ton American-made bombs drop on apartment buildings in the Gaza Strip, uh, killing scores of, of, of civilians. Uh, so I think, you know, one of the reasons that BDS uh, exists is precisely because of folks like uh, Professor Friedman, who talk a certain game about settlements, but refuse to actually call for any change in policy that would change Israeli behavior. The failure of governments to address the violations of international law and human rights abuses that the Israeli state carries out is the reason why civil society has taken up uh, this, uh, uh, this objective and is working to use boycott, divestment, and sanctions to make that change happen. And let me just say one last Last thing about the argument that Mr. that Professor Friedman put forward here, it's the same exact argument, and you can go back and read the read the op-ed pieces that were written by the apolog apologists for South African apartheid. It's the same argument that we used to hear back in the 70s and 80s when people were saying it's time to divest from the apartheid system in South Africa. The apologists for apartheid were saying, look, there's all kinds of horrible things going on in Africa and elsewhere. Why are are you singling out South Africa? Don't you understand? The blacks in South Africa have it so much better than blacks elsewhere in Africa. I mean, the arguments are almost word for word the same. And the reality is that the outcome has to be the same as well. And the apologists for apartheid cannot be allowed to win. It's only through the uh, efforts, the nonviolent efforts of civil society to hold Israel accountable for its violations of abuses of, and abuses of, of Palestinian human rights that we are going to see any kind of change on the ground, especially if governments like the United States government, uh, which is playing such a ro large role, 
uh, continue to abdicate in their responsibility of doing something. I want to thank you both for being with us. Yusuf Munir, executive director of the U.S. Campaign to End the Israeli Occupation, and Robert Friedman, visiting professor of political science at Johns Hopkins University, former head of Baltimore Hebrew University. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, we go to Arizona, one of the primary states, uh, to find out what happened to a U.S. citizen. Why was she put in the hands of ICE? Stay with us. Se quedan mudos, otros tienen memoria para olvidar. Si la violencia es un espejo que se rompe y nuestras lágrimas caídas gritarán. Solo recuerda que mi cara tiene un nombre y nunca más se callará. Y nunca más. Nunca Más, No More, by La Santa Cecilia, performing here at our Democracy Now! studios. To see our whole interview with them, as well as many of their performances, go to democracynow.org. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. Democratic and Republican voters are heading to the polls today in Utah, in Arizona, Democrats in Idaho as well, underscoring the battle over immigration reform. In Arizona, demonstrators shut down a highway, leading to a rally for Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump outside Phoenix Saturday delaying the rally. Three people were arrested, including Jacinta Gonzalez, a leading immigrant right advocate, who had locked her neck to a van's window as part of the roadblock. Gonzalez was then transferred to immigration custody, despite being a U.S. citizen. U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, released a statement saying that, quote, all foreign-born individuals who are booked into the Maricopa County Jail are interviewed by ICE personnel to determine alienage and removability, and whether they would be an enforcement priority for the agency. The Office of the Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio has been monitored by the U.S. Justice Department for what it calls a systematic disregard for basic constitutional protections. Well, Jacinta Gonzalez joins us right now. Welcome to Democracy Now! Talk about what happened to you this weekend. Thank you so much for having us. Um, well, as you said, we decided to protest the Trump event and shut it down by using our bodies and putting ourselves on the line. Um, we did this because we understand that Trump is more than just a candidate. We understand that the political space that he's opening up is bringing up threats against our community. We're seeing it in the state legislature here in Arizona. For example, there's many anti-immigrant bills that are going to be possibly signed by Governor Ducey later this week, which is why we're urging him to say no to Trump and veto those bills. Um, but we also saw that the operation, the machinery that is in place right now for racial profiling is alive and well. So many of the words that Donald Trump is promoting and saying that he's going to do are already in existence. And we know that as a community, we have to be able to resist and push back. Now, you were arrested with two other people. What happened to them, Jacinta? They were released. Um, we were all released on our own recognizance, and they were able to get out of the jail much earlier. Um, because of my, my surname, um, I was singled out for interviews. I defended my constitutional rights, and I was retaliated against. And for that reason, I was held overnight. Um, in, in, in the jail, um, and then transferred to immigration custody. Um, this just, again, proves that racial profiling is alive and well in Arizona, and Trump is opening up more space to liven up that debate and to encourage people to promote policies of hate. And so for us, it's so important for us to push back against this current administration that says that it's against the policies of Trump, yet what we're seeing in the jails is that they're doing exactly the same thing. They're promoting racial profiling, they're violating people's constitutional rights and their own protocols. Um, in essence, it's the equivalent of if President Trump were to come in to be the president of the United States, they're handing him a car with a full tank of gas to deport communities, incarcerate them, and racial profile. And that's why we must push back on, on both sides of this. Jacinta Gonzalez, um, Donald Trump isn't president yet. Yet, do you see his rhetoric having an effect on legislation, for example, in your state of Arizona? 
Yes, like I mentioned, right now we're facing several anti-immigrant bills, as, as well as anti-refugee bills, when, bills that are anti-women and that are increasing incarceration. Um, this is a space that is being opened up because of the Trump campaign. Um, he's livening up racial hatred in America, and that's why we're, we're continuing to resist. Um, Governor Ducey will have to face the dilemma this week. He'll have to decide, is he on the side of Trump, on the side of laws like SB 1070 that also have been proven to be unconstitutional, or will he be on the side of the Constitution and immigrant rights and family unity? Jacinta, you were protesting Donald Trump, but you were arrested under the Bush administration. I mean, rather, under uh, under the Obama administration. Of course, it's President Obama who's um, the president today. Yeah. I mean, this is, is, again, what we're seeing over and over in our communities, is detainers, um, immigration enforcement, raids, deportations have consistently been up with, with President Obama. There's a reason he's called the deporter-in-chief. Now, there's been some relief, but a lot of the infrastructure that he built out continues to exist. ICE and Border Patrol are the largest police force in America, yet they have very little oversight. So imagine what would happen with an agency that's already rogue, that's already detaining citizens and violating the Constitution under someone like Donald Trump. So we understand the difficulties of the reality now and understand the dangers of having someone like Trump in control of that type of infrastructure. I want to thank you very much for being with us. Uh, Jacinta Gonzalez, field director of Mi Gente, a national political hub for um, Latinx organizing. Uh, we're going to continue the interview and post online at democracynow.org. That does it for our broadcast, Democracy Now's three job openings. Check our website. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.